and she could potentially lead a country, but she'd be banned from leading many congregations. So why does Sarah Palin seem to be winning over so many evangelicals? Let's bring in two people who may have some answers for us. Woody Bauckham is a pastor at Grace Family Baptist Church in Spring, Texas, and Margaret Feinberg is an evangelical speaker who lived in Alaska for five years and saw Palin get elected to governor. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Uh, Margaret, let's start with you. I want you both actually to touch on this quickly. Uh, why does her faith matter? Her faith matters because it says a lot about um, who she is as a person and her outlooks on life and the policies that will come to play in our nation. Reverend Bauckham? I agree completely. Uh, politi political ideology is really an outgrowth of our religious beliefs. You can't separate what a person believes from how a person will govern. So I think it's incredibly important that we know where people stand on religious issues. So, Margaret, why do you think she's winning over these evangelicals uh, that have been so skeptical of McCain? I think on one hand, she's known for her conservative values, and that's translated in her leadership and her time in Alaska. But I think also for younger evangelicals, there is a hunger to see in a more exciting ticket. Um, there was kind of a ho-hum factor for McCain, but when Palin came on board, she added the vavoom that was so needed in order to garner the attention and the excitement for young evangelicals. And, and here's what's interesting, Reverend Bauckham, she's winning over church members, uh, church leaders that don't even allow women uh, to preach at the pulpit, yet she could be leading the country. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, it's interesting. The bottom line on that is people look at this ticket and their fear is that we will have Barack Obama as our president, that we will be moved toward a socialist agenda, that we would have the most radically pro-abortion candidate ever to run for president to serve in that office. And that is an untenable position for evangelicals. And so they look at this and they're trying to decide this based on what's best for the nation in the here and now and oftentimes overlooking some of those other issues. Do, do you think that that's something that, are you saying that should be, that shouldn't be overlooked? I mean, do you think that women in evangelical circles where women are not allowed uh, to preach, uh, let's say Palin and McCain do win, and here you have this woman that could possibly be leading the free world, uh, and yet there's evangelicals voting for her that don't even believe that, that a woman should preach at the pulpit. Are, are, should, could this change the face of how evangelicals believe in the woman's role? I don't think it'll change the way evangelicals believe about women's roles. I think it's, it has sparked a discussion. And quite frankly, feminism has gained a foothold in many evangelical churches. Do you think and that's a good of, thing? No, I don't. Not at all. Why not? Uh, well, because we're about the gospel. The culture doesn't dictate truth. The gospel dictates truth. My job is not to be a political pundit or political activist. My job is to be a pastor and proclaim the truth of the gospel as clearly as I possibly can. Well, wait a minute. What about the Old Testament and, and the prophet Deborah? I mean, she was a political leader. She was a wife. She was a mother. She was one of the, the biggest forces in, in the book of Judges. So that's the gospel right there. Uh, she, she certainly was. And the fact that something happened doesn't mean that it's normative for the church. In Isaiah chapter 3, for example, one of the signs that a culture is under judgment is that women are in leadership in their nations. So Deborah was actually a sign that things were be very bad in Israel, not a norm for the church. Margaret, I, I'm curious to see what you think about this and what the Reverend's saying. I think that that's a fair perspective, Vody, but I think we also need to look at Ephesians 5, which describes, you know, it's saying that husbands are to lay down their lives for their wives, just as Jesus Christ laid down his life um, for the church. And in the same way, I think Todd has done an incredible job opening up the opportunity for Palin to use the gifts and the talents and the passions that she has been given in order to make a difference in her community and possibly in our nation and world on a significant political landscape and effect. Margaret, is the reverend sounding a little sexist or is it just me? <laughs> I would have to say the reverend is, is sounding a little um, questionable there. But in the sense that I believe that everyone, um, despite gender, has an opportunity to serve, to give, and to play a role in making a difference in their communities, in their churches, and around the world. Reverend, this could be an exciting time. I mean, this could break through. We're becoming progressive in so many ways. We're seeing a black man possibly winning the presidency. We're seeing a woman here that's uh, on the Republican ticket that, that's, you know, rousing up uh, evangelicals uh, possibly to think twice about the woman's role in the church. I mean, this is fascinating times. They are fascinating times, and they're also frightening times. When you see Margaret Feinberg you use Ephesians chapter 5, uh, which clearly says that a husband 
is the head of the wife in order to justify somehow with this sleight of hand that Palin's husband is laying down his life by allowing her to do that. Number one, she's playing fast and loose with the text. And secondly, she is also ignoring the fact that Palin's responsibility as a wife and mother is governed by scripture, not by whether we feel it's progressive in our culture. Margaret, final thought but, but, there. Cody, I believe that's a narrow interpretation and a boxy interpretation of the text, as well as the role of women, who in today's working families, many families in the United States need both the man and the wife in order to work outside of the home, in order to support the family, and to put that kind of burden on the family, whereby a woman must stay at home, um, I just don't think that translates into many working class families today. You know, my job is not to translate into working class families. My job is to be honest with the text. And the text says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, a woman is to be the keeper of her home. Now, I will not violate the teaching of the text in order to somehow sound more appropriate for the culture. I am a herald of the truth of the gospel, and my job is to teach the gospel according to what the authors have said, not according to what I think the culture wants to hear. I think but Vodi being a keeper of the home can be translated in so many different ways. And that means that if a woman happens to be the breadwinner, winner, shouldn't they have the opportunity to step out and take care of their family in that way? Listen. All right, what about the text that says the man and the woman should submit to one another? I think I'm just going <laughs> to leave it right there, folks. And I'm going to be studying the Bible tonight, and I promise to bring you two back, especially as we see this go forward and seeing how evangelicals vote. Thank you so much, Margaret Feinberg and Reverend Bodie Bauckham. Thank you. All right, guys.